Uh, I'm the Chief Operating Officer of EADS North America in uh, Washington, D.C. We've got about a billion six in revenues, and uh, we're essentially in charge of North America. We're selling uh, helicopters to the Army and uh, competing with uh, Boeing for the tanker program, which is probably what most people are aware of right now. Although we're doing, we're selling about $400 million worth of uh, helicopters to the Army. We sell Coast Guard nearly all of their helicopters and, and all of their transport aircraft. We're probably the largest supplier to the uh, Department of Homeland Security. And we just, uh, we're providing a radar for the Navy's new uh, uh, major ship things like that, major. Basically, what we are trying to do is uh, bring really good products from Europe here to the United States and build them in the United States to provide competition and provide a, a pathway to Europe. My talk is sort of based on my background. Uh, you, you don't know this, but I, I spent 32 years in the military. And, uh, and then I went to, and I formed, I went to work for defense companies, and then I went back in the Defense Department as a political appointee, and I was the number two guy buying things for the Defense Department. And I was in number two guy in charge acquisition. Then I went out and formed my own company and advised all the major defense product companies. And then I went to Iraq, uh, and I was uh, the, the Minister of Finance for Iraq and also for the United States in Iraq, for Bremer. And I was the Director of Management and Budget in Iraq. And I was also Minister of Planning. And I was really, and I was there for the first five months. And I came back and I was really disappointed because I had good Aussies working for me and good Brits and good Spaniards and good Italians and good Poles. And the Americans were bright people, but they were not helpful to me. Why was that? Because most of them had never been out of the United States. And most of them did not understand any culture other than that from their home county in Iowa. And most of them did not understand. They had never, they didn't understand, they'd lived in Kansas all their lives and they had not ever feared Iowa invading them. And that brings up a, a culture that makes you not understand the rest of the world. And so I decided that if the United States is going to lead the world, then we need to involve business. And I'd been in the military, and I knew how strong and how good our military is. And I knew how good military-to-military -military con uh, contacts are, because they are good. And I'd been an admiral and all that, so I had been involved in doing that. And I had been a political appointee, so I knew how good the political appointees are, but they're limited because there are only a limited number of them. But what's not involved in this business is business is not involved adequately. And the thing about business is once you have business involved between countries, is that path, a contract, a, a conversation, the fact that money is going and you're both interested in making a product and, and keeping people employed, means there's an avenue for continued discussion, even when the countries find a reason not to talk to each other, even when the governments do. And I believe that if, which I, I happen to believe the challenge for the next several hundred years is to maintain peace. I actually believe that, because I've lived this, um, 
my children did not see me most of the time because I spent most of the time underseas away from my children when they were growing up. And if you think about, if you were my age, there are essentially six generations of people either have died or spent a lot of time away from their families trying to protect us from Nazism and Stalinism. So what are you going to do for the next 400 years? Because the only people who have maintained peace in this world for 100 years since the birth of Christ were a bunch of people like warm beer and mashed peas. I mean, and those are the only people who have done it. And if we're going to do it, we need to involve everybody. And it turns out the people that are not involved right now are business people. So how do, so how do you do it? And, now, and so I went looking for a company that was doing it. And EADS, in my belief, is the only company that's truly doing that in the United States. They're doing it by essentially, instead of, and there, there are other companies that are different models, but what they're trying to do is in, they are uh, trying to take really good products that where the IP is, in, is maintained in Europe and come over to the United States and say, we'll bring this over and we'll compete and then we'll build the product in the United States and we'll compete in the United States. Now, as you know, without competition, you have nothing. I know because I was in the in, uh, military and also in, as was a uh, political appointee and I did not understand it is the thumb of competition that keeps things fair and keeps things from, uh, keeps innovation going. Without that, you have nothing. It is only competition. Government cannot do, do decide on uh, program selection without competition. Right now, EADS and Boeing are involved in a, in a very high profile competition for a air tanker. No matter who wins, the Air Force will have won because the price of that tanker will have been reduced six, 60 to $100 million per plane that they never would have gotten without it. And innovation will have been fueled. Competition fuels innovation. Now, industry, left to our own devices, will never tell people that, our customers that, because we, we'd like to have sole source things. And we will invent all sorts of arguments to tell you that, to tell our customers that, why it's best for them. And in each case, uh, that's not the most honest approach. It's not in the best interest of our customers. Competition, capitalism and competition, really works for the customers. I think you frequent, infrequently find the participants actually promoting that. This is not in your best interest if you have the contract. Once you get the contract, that's not in your best interest. Your best interest is to bring your second rate or third rate guys on and have them do that contract and take your first rate guys on to steal the contract from somebody else, right? I mean, that's what we do. And Unfortunately, in the defense industry, frequently our customers don't realize that. So it's important that we do that. And we need to understand that. And I think it's important. And I think that the competition that brings, without competition, you don't have innovation. Ever since uh, we reduced the number of companies in the, uh, after the Last Supper, we do not have enough competition. I was really pleased to see Ash Carter's speech uh, two days ago in which he said he was not going to allow the top tier of defense companies to consolidate. I thought that was a brilliant stroke and I absolutely agree with him. And, and, and if he went down to paragraph seven of that, he talked about the fact that he looks forward to international companies coming in because he talked about the importance of competition. I thought he had it exactly right and I thought it was, uh, I thought it was really well done. Innovation happens. It is astounding how conservative and risk approach companies are as they get larger and how you have to, 
ensure that you reach down and make sure that you use the innovation of the smaller companies and the, and the brilliant people. This is not a problem for us because we're not big enough to do this. In other words, we are a large company. We're, we're actually the largest aerospace company in the world. And in fact, we, we buy more and export more aerospace products from the United States than anyone. I don't know why you realize it's $11 billion. But in the United States, we're not. We're only less than $2 billion right now. So we're not large enough that I have this problem. In other words, I can reach out and touch all the people, and I don't have the problem of being risk adverse. People would tell you that's not my problem. I think you would find. And, and so, that, in my opinion, that doesn't tend to come until you get to about the $10 billion level. And so that's not our problem yet, and I don't have to address that. If you look at defense spending in the last, since 1943, defense spending in the United States is about the same. Adjusted for inflation, it actually 1943, 1952. Since the invention of nuclear weapons, if you look at it, and it goes up and down depending on wars and depending on how we feel, and it's not as a percent of GDP, but it's, uh, it's a percent of dollars and a tempen, and you look at all the countries in the world and whether or not they have enemies right next to each other and how they feel about things. And I actually had it when I was in the government. I had a bunch of guys do this and look at it since 1300 and for all the countries in the world. And it's really sort of interesting because you want to see how countries react and how they feel about it. And all countries react about the same, by the way. It's really funny. But the U.S. population feels sort of comfortable with the level of defense spending. In this case, it's pretty significant. It's a significant amount. And the amount that the United States populace feels comfortable spending happens to be about the equivalent to what the rest of the world spends on defense. That, for countries in the U.S., for companies in the U.S. and involved in the defense, ought to be a fertile field for us to find uh, products to sell to our customers if we are innovative and are providing value. Do you, I don't know if you read this, what, what uh, Secretary Carter said, because I really believe this strongly. It's not the purpose of the United States, should not be the purpose of the United States, and, and, and Secretary Carter said this, to make a profit on our allies because our allies have to have their own industries make, uh, be robust so that their political uh, parties support them so that they remain allies and may remain interested in having their own defense industries or else we lose them and we lose their cultural support for when we go someplace or we end up like we did in Iraq well, we get over there and we do not have support of some of the key cultural communities that understand the Middle East, and it works out just the way it worked out. I think we have to work together. I think we have to buy things from other countries when their products are better. And I think we have to sell things when our products are better, but I do not think that we want to crush the rest of the world, nor do I think the U.S. makes the best products in many cases. And I think that's a fact. When I'm in Iraq, when I was in Iraq, I was lying underneath the desk, making a phone call. I was called by the Pentagon. I'm being under mortar fire. 
Pentagon called me to get me to call a company in Belgium to get them to make breastplates for the armored, that would stop an armored bullet because the company in the U.S. couldn't make good enough breastplates, right? And I also need to call Congress to get them to waive the Buy American Acts, they'd buy the breastplates so they could put it on soldiers. Now, I thought this was sort of odd that I'm getting shot at and there's nobody in the Pentagon that knows who the right guy to call in Congress to get them to waive this to buy the breastplate. But since I didn't have one, I thought might as well go ahead and do this. That's crazy, right? You understand what I'm saying? There ought to be more than me that knows how to make the system work and knows that's a guy in Belgium that makes better breastplates than anybody in the United States. Belgium has always been known for doing this better. It happens to be well known. There's a country that makes better ammo. This, there are various... The United States does not have... that does not have the repository of genius. And we know this. <laughs>